so happy that my life has made it possible that I've met you and we spent such good days together at USM and I'm so proud to be your friend. Uh, we've got some great memories and I'm excited to see what tonight will be all about and have some good laughs. I need another ride in that Porsche. George and I have been friends for more than 40 years and during those 40 years, whenever I've been around him, I always think of George as lightning in a bottle. You know, I, I may, it may be in the video. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, George, thank you. Thank you for all you did for the university, for what you've done for me personally, and for the state of Maine, and for the Portland area. It's been tremendous. Uh, my best story is when I first uh, became president, he was working for me. I, I had to encourage him to work for me, by the way. It was about a 45 minute interview of me before he accepted my job offer. Uh, but more importantly, the first thing he says within the first few weeks, he said, are you going to continue to wear those cheap suits? I said, what are you talking about? I've always worn these suits. He said, right, that's the problem. You, you now are, are, are going to be in a place where you are going to have to tighten up a little bit, improve your overall sartorial uh, representation. So he takes me to this place where you can't buy a shirt for under $300. But anyway, uh, I, I believe he has uh, helped me get a little bit uh, more class and style, so I just can't thank George enough for that, too. Uh, congratulations to George. Uh, also, uh, the story that comes to mind for me is that he is unstoppable. Uh, so he was down, I think, running multiple races down in Florida and uh, ended up quite ill and in the hospital and I remember we reached out to him and he said I'll be back on my feet in no time and that is what George is all about. Congratulations. Well deserved. It's just yeah. terrific. Who knew he was Irish? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight we're holding our 12th annual celebration. The clatter is a beloved symbol to the people of Irish descent. It represents the ideals of friendship, love, and loyalty. The Clatter Award is given each year to a person who has dedicated his or her life to service within the Maine community. I'm pleased to say that tonight, the board of the Maine Irish Heritage Center honors George Campbell. George's strong work ethic, strategic leadership skills have been on display during his decades-long professional career, leading municipalities, state agencies, and several notable private entities. George also served on the City Council here in Portland and served as its mayor. He has led fundraising efforts for numerous community organizations and the University of Southern Maine <laughs> Foundation. His leadership, hard work, and dedication has made a huge difference in the lives of the citizens of Maine. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our sponsors of tonight's event. Your gifts support the mission of the Maine Irish Heritage Center, which is to promote Irish heritage, history, and culture throughout Maine, and to continue to serve as a gathering place for Maine's new immigrants, and to preserve this landmark, which to us is our Irish Cathedral of Maine. I also need to recognize and say thank you to both Ed Kane and Corey Haskell for being the co-chairs of tonight's event. And Ed will also serve as our master's, uh, master's ceremonies for tonight. I want to take a brief moment to give thanks to some individuals who through their hard work and dedication pulled everything together for tonight's celebration and they are Mary McElhaney. <laughs> Pat McBride. <laughs> Ann Lackey. 
Janine Manning. Dan Mahoney and Kimberly Clark of Dan Mahoney Presents. Josh Schwann of Media Northeast. Along with a special thanks to our founding partner of the center, and that's the Irish American Club of Maine. Also, I don't want to forget SOPO Catering. Uh, they're the people that are taking care of us tonight. I believe that our organization is truly blessed to have the number of volunteers that we have and that are passionate about our center and are always willing to give it their all for the betterment, betterment of the center. Without their efforts, no one, uh, none of this would be possible. I thank you all. At this time, I now turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies, Ed Kane. Uh, good evening and welcome. My name is Ed Kane. I don't know about being Master of Ceremonies. Mary McElhinney said I, could, I was the traffic cop. And that was my, that was my job. Uh, Corey Haskell and I, uh, it is said, are the co-chairs of this event. And um, however, I just want to um, reiterate what Mark was saying. That was Mary McElhinney and that team that um, she named that have done virtually all the work. She has retained strict control over, over everything. And uh, we are committed to starting on time and then ending on time, barring any surprises. So let me start with recognition of honored guests, which of course would start with uh, Governor Joseph Brennan. And then um, we are uh, also happy to have with us um, Portland City Councilor Nick Mavadonis. And State Representative Margaret Craven, former Senator. <laughs> who, who was actually born in Ireland, as you will see later. Uh, Lois Galgay Reckett. <laughs> and Maureen Terry. I'd like to also take just a minute and uh, recognize the former CLADA recipients who are with us tonight. That again, we'll start with Governor Joseph Brennan. Uh, Cynthia Murray Bellavo. Jim Wellahan. Professor Michael Conley. Yeah. And last but not least, David T. Flanagan. Yeah. Now, like I said, I want to stick to a schedule, so I'm not going to describe George by going through all the positions of responsibility <laughs> and trust he has had because we have a schedule. And uh, let me mention just a few, though. Well, he's been Commissioner of Transportation in Maine, Commissioner of Transportation in New Hampshire. I think one of seven people in America who've been Commissioner of Transportation in more than one state. President of the Bolus Company, I think that was also Maine in New Hampshire. President of Pierce Atwood Consulting, President of the USM Foundation, Mayor of Portland, Portland City Councilor, President of the James W. Sewell Company, which is, um, and, uh, and a partner in Treadwell Franklin, which are the things that he's doing uh, right, right now. And so, um, and I just want to say on a personal note, during my long friendship with George, it has always, always been true that as a result of that friendship, I have been a better person. You know? And I know that a lot of your friends feel the same way, George. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And now, um, let's uh, meet Shane Caffrey, the young Shane Caffrey is Ireland's Deputy Consul General in Boston, 
Uh, this is his first time to Maine. I think he got a windshield tour today and, and had, um, had lunch at a local pub, so he's been properly introduced. Um, and uh, the ambassador and the consul general have both been here recently, as you, as you may know. Uh, Shane has been with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or in the office of the Taoiseach, and then back to the uh, um, Department of Foreign Affairs for the last five years. His previous engagements have been interesting. They've included theater, an internship with Congressman Joe Crowley from the Bronx, uh, who's John Baldacci's great pal, uh, trekking across Argentina and Panama solo, and, <laughs> and teaching at a school for the blind in Tanzania. So it's a, it's a, a pr pretty impressive collection of things that he's done, and um, we want to come. We welcome you to Maine, Shane. Thank you very much for that. Jeev, August Falcher of Gajin Okot, Spasil to Show, Sanok, San Unid, Irika, or Son of Heron at Portland. Shane Caffrey is Anam Dum, August Tome on Last, Consul in Boston, or Son of Heron. It's more an Anam Dum, a Van Show, August Grame, August Gormag of Lahai and Law, Ian Thuck and You. It's Kahar A. Honest Bia Shield at Portland, August Asher Suller Dum, Gwil Cree Gwilak Bio on Show. It's an honour for me to be here, and thank you for inviting me to make a few brief remarks this evening. Portland is an absolutely wonderful city, and it is clear to me that the work of the Maine Irish Heritage Centre is right at the heart of what happens in the city. Um, and the, as I was introduced to the Vice Consul here in Boston, and I've arrived here just three months ago, so today does mark my first day in Maine, and it was, certainly will not be my last, so thank you very much. The, um, the role of the Irish Consul is to provide services to Irish citizens and the Irish American community. We want to connect with the diaspora, we want to promote Ireland, and we want to strengthen the links between Ireland and all of New England. We're not just for Boston, but we're for all of New England. I want to make that very clear to everybody here as well. <laughs> the, the Irish Consulate in Boston, we're marking our 90th year uh, this year. So when you consider the Irish state is not quite 100 years old, that'll tell you about how important this part of the world is for Ireland. But of course, by the time the Irish Consulate opened in Boston, the Irish were already very well established uh, in Maine. And the first Irish arriving here, I think, in the 1700s. And of course, here in Portland, the Irish Americans have dominated the Docklands, and the deep association remains to this day. Indeed, I was brought out to the Western uh, Cemetery today, and we found gravestones from my own county of Meath, dating back to the 1830s. So the, the history is there, there's no denying it. So to that end, I must uh, mention this very impressive building that we're in today at the moment. St. Dominic's opened in 1893, built and used by Irish immigrants for over 100 years. And as a credit to everybody, this place is still alive, it's still full of people who care a lot about the Irish community, care about the history here, and are very, you know, just know what's going on. So it's very, very impressive, and we really see this, and we're very impressed by it. The main Irish Heritage Centre and all who work here and all who volunteer here have been absolutely credit to this history, and their mission to protect, preserve, and restore is the one that should be used as a shining example for all the many other institutions throughout New England. You do us all very proud. So today alone, I was brought out to the memorial, the Great Hunger Memorial. I saw many beautiful lighthouses, Spent some time at the library and the Heritage Centre here, and even managed to squeeze in a, a pint in, uh, in Feeney's as well. So it was a nice lunch. <laughs> so thank you very much to, to Bob, James, and Matt for showing me around. And to Mary and to the entire team here, the work that you have put in here allows Irish culture to, to thrive. So congratulations to you. Thank you for your time. And congratulations to George today. And uh, congratulations on your award. So Gorham Magav Galer. Salam. Thank you. As Mark was saying, one of the you know, one of the three legs of the stool of the mission of the Maine Irish Heritage Center is the preservation and protection of this building. And if you think, if you wonder, is that worthwhile? Is it valuable? You should go to the west of Ireland sometime and see a you know a thousand year old B.I. pot, you know that is that is still there. You can walk by it. The people have you know that has been preserved and protected, and um, and it's uh, sometimes inconvenient, but it's an important thing to do. And um, now it's time to introduce uh, State Representative Margaret Craven, who's going to say a prayer in an Irish blessing, after which the buffet starts. Actually, you can crank it up now if you want, right? I mean, <laughs> so you've got, I think it works like, I think they're, I think they're going to pick two tables at a time and, and um, designate, okay? Thank you. Falcher Rubilic. Nainam Nehel Sivik, Skerit Neve, Amen. 
George, George Campbell, Shane Kefri, so for English speakers, I just um, ask blessing for everybody here tonight and for the food that we're going to eat and for all of the contributions that George has made to our state and uh, to everybody living here. And just because um, of uh, the turmoil that our uh, country is going through at the moment, I am going to have a quote from my favorite Connemara poet for you to think about. Your soul knows the geography of your destiny. Your soul alone has the map of your future. Therefore, you can trust this indirect, oblique side of yourself. If you do it, you will, you take, it will take you where you need to go. But more important, it will teach you a kindness of rhythm in your journey. John O'Donoghue. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you very much. Corey Haskell from USM um, is going to, um, from the USM Foundation, I should say, perhaps soon to be called the University of Maine Portland Foundation, but we'll see about that. Uh, but Corey Haskell is from the USM Foundation, and she has a brief and uh, beautiful video about which George knows nothing, but with respect to which he played a very, very important part. And then I think she would like to say a few things um, uh, after that, too. And uh, when I was mentioning, um, you know, present dignitaries before, there was one significant omission, and I mean this extremely sincerely. And this is a person who's not only um, in the right job, but doing a hell of a job at it, and that's Glenn Cummings, president of the University of Southern Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi there. How's everyone doing? Good. Um, so I'm proud to be here tonight uh, to honor George Campbell, someone we all know, know, and I think he'd probably agree that most of us love him. Um, Mary McElhaney asked me to keep this speech short, classy, family friendly, which means that I've been politely asked to leave out stories that are unflattering to either George or to the Maine, Heritage, Maine Irish Heritage Center. So I've lost about 10 pages. <laughs> I've had to redline stories related to George's sugar binging, interesting Halloween outfits, encounters with the police. That's not true. A trip George and I took to Amsterdam's red light district when I was 27. That's true and so on. Um, but I did ask some of our mutual friends to uh, share some of their favorite Georgisms to get me rolling tonight. So here are just a few of them. Yell out yours if you have some. Corey, that dog won't hunt. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. That guy is as Irish as Patty's pig. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut. And something about beating a dead horse and one of us falling off of a turnip truck. But seriously, and all kidding aside, to say that George Campbell has had a successful career in both the public and private sector would be a little bit of an understatement. So what I want to tell you about tonight is one initiative that is very close to George's heart and one that without him would not have seen the light of day. Um, as many of you know, George has helped raise million of, millions of dollars in private philanthropy over the years for organizations that serve the public good. And one of those organizations is my alma mater, the University of Southern Maine. 
Um, in 2016, George became part of that university's truly stunning turnaround story. When he took over leadership of the USM Foundation as president and CEO, in fact, one of the greatest gifts that my friend George has ever given me, and there are many, was the opportunity to join him at the foundation, where today I serve as vice president, and I drive our alumni, employer, and public engagement programs. And we've got a big team here tonight from the University of Southern Maine, from the University of Southern Maine Foundation, and from the foundation board. So shout out to them, because I know they wanted to be here tonight to support you too, George. So. So when I asked people what was most memorable about working with George, one theme that kept coming up was his ability to make people dream big. He pushed us all to do more than we thought we could do and to be more than we ever thought we could be. And George's big dream mentality was never more present than when he helped to launch and lead a multi-million dollar Promise Scholarship fundraising campaign to help motivated young people overcome some pretty serious financial, academic, social, cultural barriers, and remain in school. So a big USM Promise Scholarship dream was catalyzed when George Campbell and our president, Glenn Cummings, hatched an important plan. They plotted to introduce philanthropists Dick and Carolyn McGoldrick to two recent USM alums, Mo Owele and Brianna D. Donato who had been referred to USM by the Boys and Girls Club as students with high potential but limited means. So Mo and Brianna's tuition had been paid in full anonymously years earlier by none other than the McGoldricks. But the students and the McGoldricks had never met. So when George and Glenn connected the McGoldricks to Mo and Brianna, who were now successful USM alums, it was so clear that a college degree and their USM experience had changed their lives and the lives of their families forever. And Dick and Carolyn were inspired by that success. So, of course, George Campbell saw a match made in heaven. Ultimately, Dick and Carolyn agreed to co-chair a multi-million dollar Promise Scholarship campaign and they stepped up with the first million dollars. And together, George, Glenn, Dick, and Carolyn launched a campaign that would change the lives of 100 Maine students every single year, bridge the gap of financial aid with a Promise Scholarship, provide critical extra supports to these students to ensure they would stay in school and earn their degrees in four years without debt. Importantly, all of our Promise Scholars would be the first in their families to attend college and many of them would be immigrants, first generation Americans. And for those of us who um, have Irish ancestors, we've heard the stories from our parents and our grandparents. I think Kay Flanagan was just telling us about her, um, her family story last week. It was unbearably hard to be an immigrant back then, and it, it is unbearably hard today. And so today, the USM Foundation has raised over $5 million towards the program. And right now, 31 Promise Scholars are at USM, and we're well on our way to 100 students a year. So, yeah. So, I would like to introduce you to two of our Promise Scholars, Aiden and Emmanuel. Dan. So the Promise Scholarship is really looking for students that are predominantly the first in the family to go to college. If they didn't have this scholarship, then they likely would not be able to afford to go to college. And so we're looking for students that have shown a dedication to their youth development organization that they're being referred from. We're going to be heading off to meet with two Promise Scholars. Both have just finished their first year of college at USM. It's been very, very blessed in you. Yeah, very good. We come from South Africa, right? It was during the summer that we arrived here. I just happened to walk up the streets and we found this cool place called the Boys and Girls Club. So when I really got involved with them, I met Sarah. 
Emmanuel is a natural leader, really cares about his academics, has plans for his future. So he's even volunteered his time this summer to teach students at Deering High School. And he has these characteristics that all seem to be the perfect match for the Promise Scholarship. So the day the letter comes in, I remember leaping, jumping around my house. It, it was amazing because I knew I've been given a chance to do something no one in my family had ever done before. We know what it means to lack, we know what it means to suffer, you know. We lived in a shelter for a long time. We passed by Oxford Street where a lot of people are suffering. And I remember telling myself, one day, I'll try my best to help these guys. I just love it here. I mean, I'm kind of part of like this country feel, you know, my family. Family is so important to me. People can really struggle with, you know, anxiety, depression, and those types of things. And I was like, do I want to live my life this way or this way? And I took the path that was like, I want to go to school. I want to take every chance that comes my way. I have people in connections where they're like, Try your hardest because I'm going to be paying my college debt for 20, 30 years. You know, that's scary. And then I got the Promise Scholarship and then I'm like, okay, I don't have to work as much. You know, I can focus on my education. Promise is more than just a scholarship. These students are being supported by their peers. They're being supported by their academic advisor. They have donors who are stepping up to the plate and saying, how do we help? I can't even explain how accomplishing the feeling is, knowing that these wonderful people want to invest in your education and invest in you. You know, it is a family. It's not just an organization that gives you money. It is a family that is there to watch you succeed. Maine is facing a real shortage of the workforce. You know, if everybody leaves, what are we going to do? We need people getting their education and coming back, teaching in this area. Well, it means putting yourself less and putting other people more. And yeah, that's what the scholarship actually taught me. Your brother or your sister stands strong because you are there to pick them up. So though you are leaving college debt free, you still have the debt to give to humanity. The way you live your life speaks better than what you say. So let your life speak for you. So, George Campbell, your life certainly speaks for you. And you helped make the USM Foundation into a catalyst of transformation at USM. And all of that is because of your ability to dream big. So, the Promise Scholarship campaign that you helped launch was audacious. And its mission to change the lives of gritty, tenacious, resilient students is really the heart of USM. And in so many ways, it is at the very heart of you, George Gamble. So let your life speak for you. Uh, this fellow lurking over here is Dan Mahoney in, uh, of Dan Mahoney Presents, and he's responsible for what you're about to see, which is George N. Campbell, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> so there, listen, you're going to be really, you're going to be uh, pleased and relieved to realize that um, of the uh, four and a half hours of video um, <laughs> that was shot with John Oliver uh, doing all the, uh, all the interviewing, um, about four hours and 20 minutes of it ended up on the cutting room floor. So, so this is going to be, so... Um, after that, after the, uh, after the video, it's going to be uh, John's very dear friend, John Campbell, who is no relation uh, whatsoever, um, who has traveled from North Carolina to attend this event, um, is going to speak, and then he will introduce George's son, Sean Campbell. Dynamic. Generosity. The most remarkable tough thing is a bag of hammers. Rockstar. I uh, grew up on a farm. I'm the oldest of six children, and I grew up on a dairy farm in Brewer. He would get up at four in the morning, milk the cows, go to school, come back, milk the cows again. I was the herdsman, um, so we had a, over a hundred head of Holsteins. So you worked very, very hard. Age 11, everything burned down. 
and uh, we ended up losing half of our herd. In order to rebuild everything, we really counted on our neighbors and our community. I remember going to the barn raising and the house. Uh, we had a house that was 40 by 70, and uh, in one day they shingled everything and did everything, and I remembered that, and, and that really influenced me uh, to care about community and realize that community is everything. And then I got a chance in high school to really see that government can make a difference and that started my path. He's a mover and a shaker. Fabulous team builder. He has a lot of impact. Where the hell is George? And he's a workhorse. It's all about persistence. He just doesn't let go of it. It's exhausting just to try to keep up with his career. <laughs> what he enjoys most about his life is continuing to work hard. There's even a lot more to come, I'm sure of that. He has been into about everything. Jesus. It's a little stunning on where to even start. I mean, how many jobs has he had? 30, 40? Yeah. He, he likes to say he just can't keep one. I think one of the reasons he enjoyed working for me was uh, I fired him after a month. For the past 40 years has been fundraising for one cause or another. Yeah. And he's really good at it. He was the first to, to put a check in. When George says, oh, I have a question to ask you. I'm raising money for, okay, how much, George? Don't, don't bother with the spiel. Just tell me how much you want. Yeah, and when the phone rings today, uh, uh, you have caller ID, and he's got more numbers, so uh, he's outsmarted me. But uh, I find that uh, you can't say no to George. Very striking. Yeah. You know, no problem asking for money for a good cause, but no interest in asking for money for himself. Somewhere in this career, I hope people see some competency, you know, not just, not just the salesman part of me, <laughs> but the guy that can actually get something done. He's a leader. Bath Ironworks became aware of a dry dock that was going to be made surplus by the Navy. So George led the negotiations with Bath Ironworks, and he used his country charm and his ability to be honest and open and frank and clear and what the state could do and what Bath Ironworks needed to do to make this whole enterprise a success. And we did it. The cooperation is unheard of. I and mean, you got right. the whole congressional delegation, all of the legislature, the people of Maine, and Maine's largest employer all working together to pull something yeah. together. We put it all together. It was about a $60 million deal, the first significant public-private partnership in America. George's experience with political and private. Yeah. He knew how to he knew how to marry the two, yeah. and each person usually gets pretty much what they need to accomplish, yeah. what they need to achieve. George has a very collaborative way of dealing with people, and uh, they loved him. The people loved him, they wanted to work for him, and they were very productive under him. George cared about each one of them as individuals. Well, George is never idle chit-chatter. You, everything you say counts, yeah. and he, he's got an incredible memory. <laughs> and he can remember almost everything. You, so don't ever say anything you don't want <laughs> recalled. So when you have an impossible task, what do you do? You call George Campbell. Especially when somebody says it can't be done. You say, well, no, that's just the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> I, I don't want to comment on his height or lack of thereof. <laughs> but I, I said on many occasions it could be a 20-foot wall. And you say, George, I need you to get over that wall. He'd get over it. I've heard that uh, all good things come to he who waits if he works like the Dickens while he waits, and, <laughs> and, and George does that. George isn't always the easiest person to work with. What, did you just fall off the turnip truck? <laughs> oh, well, you can't do that. I said, look, we're going to implement the law, you do the bidding. I like dealing with people who are difficult and opinionated <laughs> because you know they're going to get things done. He's without doubt one of the smarter people I've, I've ever ran into. I mean, you can see that by the success he's had in life, and he's, uh, he's spread it to other things than just the businesses that he's been into. It's uh, the people that um, he's been involved with. He's such a people person, and you know, you, if you're with George, he introduces you to everybody, and he just treats everybody the same. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, 
George was a real champion for trying to create diversity and, and particularly create opportunities for uh, women at DOT. Well, I'm an example of that. In the Maine State Development Office, I was the only female professional. It just became natural for us to do things together because we were equals. We'd known each other in graduate school. When he went to the Maine Department of uh, Transportation, and I was appointed as the director of Maine State Development Office, I was the first woman and the youngest person to ever have that job. Sweet man. Lightning in a bottle. Quite a guy. Cheerleader. Magnanimous. What you see is what you get. What George has is immense loyalty. He said, Joe, loyalty never goes out of style. I could call George Campbell wherever he was, whatever he was doing, and A, he would take my call, <laughs> and B, he would do whatever he could to help me. Uh, I've known George since 87 and value him as one of my great, great friends. So I've known George over 30 years and I've never been disappointed. He certainly has created um, and opened up opportunities for me um, in my career and um, most of the time I've been thankful about that. <laughs> <laughs> he has been very good to me. It just doesn't get any better than George Campbell. A real supportive, encouraging, positive friend. Any issue that I have, George is the first person I call. If you lay it on the table before George, he assesses it, tells you if he can help you, and if he can't help you, he tries to direct you to someone who can help you. There's nobody in New England that George doesn't know. The most superb connector. When I think of all the people that I know in Portland and all of my new friends, I can re directly pinpoint them back to George. More than anything, what George does is he connects people with each other. He is really um, the person that brings so many people together because of his uh, friendships, he aligns people with each other that then can go on and do other things together. Are we sure he's Irish? We're, we're pretty sure we're from County Tyrone. I mean, we can ditch this with the Irish temper. He looks like Irish. Yeah. Can you be Irish by adoption? You're asking the same question I asked when I went to George Mitchell's. George gets embarrassed when I tell him you put him in the, in the same category as George Mitchell, but he's right up there. He's touched so many lives, not just mine, but so many in greater Portland and all for the good. It's very hard to try to find a person who's had such an effect on so many people's lives. He took adversity and he knows how to get through adversity. George is always afraid that he's going to go back to brewer shoveling cow manure. <laughs> so that's always what's driven him partially. I'll tell you, I think George is happiest when he's mentoring people and finding folks that he thinks are capable, smart, um, able, but maybe haven't had all the opportunities that could mirror a little bit of what uh, he experienced early in his life. At USM, he was laser focused on how USM could make a deep impact in the lives of new Mainers. When George first got to the foundation, the first thing he designed was something called the Promise Scholarship Program. He actually framed the name and he said, we're gonna go and work with all of these youth serving organizations. We're gonna find out who are the great leaders who have no money. They see that talent. And that was his signature, immediately his signature scholarship. It says a lot about George. His real uh, love and his great passion is serving the community and building a better and stronger community. Core to him is that sense of commitment to the community. Um, it's always been there. It's been the constant in his um, career, as varied as it is. George Campbell is the kind of person that represents that being hopeful and doing good for others. Being a person that serves others is really the way to live a life. And in so many ways, he, he embodies the, the life that was of public service, but service to humanity. For me, and I think for so many other people, is what gives us assurance that the world's okay. Did you tape that? Yeah, he's okay, got that. Give me my money now. <laughs>
I am John Campbell, as has been noted. I am not related to George by blood. Uh, in fact, it was some time uh, we'd known each other for, for a very long time before George mentioned to me that he was Irish, which does raise a little suspicion. I'm Scottish Campbell. Um, and I appreciate the fact that the host let me in and let me take the microphone, no less. So that's, that's really terrific. Um, you know, I have a little bit of Irish blood in me, so I know the Irish like a good story. And I have a short one. And it's really a love story. I see a few people perking up there. It's not, it's not that kind of love story, OK? It's, it's really a story of love between two true friends. And uh, it's very special for me to share it with you. Uh, George and I met uh, in my, where I'm from, in North Carolina, at a convention of DOT executives and commissioners. And, there, and it was one of those situations where you know, everyone in the room was bidding for multi-million dollar road and bridge contracts. And people had an agenda. And, and so there was a lot of kissing of the rings going on. And I was watching all of this. And, uh, and a mutual friend said, you two are named Campbell. You should talk to one another. And we were both ready to have a break. So we, we had a cup of coffee, in George's case, a cup of tea. And we, and we started talking to each other. Uh, and I'll never forget that night the conversation with my wife, Ann, because I said, I met this extraordinary guy, George Campbell, today. And I said, yeah, I, I talked to him for about an hour and a half, two hours. And I said, the damnedest thing happened. I, I, I told him about my father's alcoholism, and I told him about dropping out of high school, and I told him about all my anxieties related to this you know, new business that I was uh, starting. And and Ann said, oh my gosh, you guys weren't even drinking. And you know, how, who, <laughs> how did you end up going there with this person that you didn't know? And I don't know if any of you have had this experience with George. I mean, it really speaks to the power of human intuition. But I knew from the very first time I met George that I could trust him completely. I knew that. And, and over time, as I've been privileged to get to know George, as many of you have been uh, you know, motivated and, and inspired to be better, your, your best self, right? He gets up every morning at 5.30, 6 a.m., doesn't matter how cold it is, and he runs. I don't always want to do that when I'm visiting Portland, right? But George, <laughs> does that. He pushes himself, and he goes to work, and he pushes other people. He pushes us to be our best, right? And he inspires us to do things that we ordinarily wouldn't be predisposed to do. And, and that's pretty extraordinary. You know, I, I did, as a friend, know George going through his scare with cancer, and I have to tell you, he just so positive that he was going to beat it, and so uh, clear in his pathway. And all of that, I think so many of us in this room have drawn from that over time. But for me, the gift of having someone to, to talk to who's had no agenda, who's helped me through some incredibly difficult times in my life, shared the benefit of his wisdom and his humor and I would say, you know, this is, this is the greatest gift of all, is unconditional love. And I think many of us feel that from George. He's always there to offer us that unconditional love that's so difficult to find. And so I was really glad to hear, because I decided not to talk about George Campbell, the mayor, or George Campbell, the CEO, or George Campbell, the DOT commissioner, or any of those amazing things, those are all in George's DNA because he is more passionate than any human being I know about making this world a better place. He's really serious about that, and he's really committed to it, and it's incredibly inspiring to me. But to me, what I you know, felt I most wanted to share 
with you was this miracle that I've experienced of meeting a true friend on the journey. And so uh, I was going to end, but I, but I am also feeling like I want to mention one other special person, that's Don Stiles. Don, a very <laughs> accomplished person in her own right and, and someone who is inspirational in so many ways. Don, as George's partner and wife now for four years, uh, George has really made George's life complete and joyful. And Don, we're so thankful to you for all the things uh, that you do. And so I'm going to turn it over to, to Sean in a moment. But before I do, I want to say I know that there are some extraordinarily special people in this room. Just over the course of time, I've met a few of you. I meet them. I think we have some of the best people in the world assembled here as friends of George. I really and truly do. It's a remarkable group. And I, I want to thank you for all that you do and say God bless you all. And especially tonight, God bless and thanks for our dear and true friend, George Campbell. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I am uh, Sean Patrick uh, Campbell. And it is a pleasure to be here tonight uh, uh, and part of this very special evening to honor my father. It's especially rewarding to do this in a place dedicated to providing Maine's diverse communities a home for sharing their cultural heritages. My Irish heritage is something that is exceedingly important to me and something about which I am very proud. Um, you know, large portions of my father's life, as you saw in this video and you've heard from the other speakers this evening, uh, exemplify the purpose of this award. Uh, to recognize an Irish American uh, who has dedicated his or her life to improving uh, the lives of others. I happen to be one of those others. Um, when I moved to Portland exactly 25 years ago this year, I don't live here any longer, but I was here for almost 14 years, um, I quickly learned that I had a tagline uh, a a two-word sobriquet, if you will, uh, George's son. <laughs> and sometimes it came in the form of a question, George's son. <laughs> Other times it was a simple statement, George's son. <laughs> uh, sometimes a declaration, George's son, <laughs> followed by a warm embrace. Um, you know, for for some 20-year-olds just out of college, um, moving to the big city, getting your hustle on, uh, that might feel a little bit boxing in. Um, uh, some might have bristled. Um, it feels maybe like your wings might be clipped a little bit. No chance to make mistakes. People know who you are. That was not the case for me at all. Um, because of my father, I actually quickly found a home here, and I found a place where I belonged. Uh, it was easy for me to recognize what it meant to have that feeling of belonging, um, as these were ways that I had always been embraced by my dad. Um, from him and from my mother, who's here tonight, uh, I grew up understanding that everyone is equal, everyone deserves dignity, and respect for their humanity. Uh, this feeling of belonging for me wasn't always naturally the case. As someone who didn't particularly conform to expectations of what it meant to be a little boy uh, in small town Maine in the 70s and 80s, um, I know what it was like to be an outsider. Um, this was long before the time of glee and will and grace and um, uh, uh, opportunities where um, you know, it was hip and cool and chic and Instagrammable to have a fun gay friend. Um, uh, I, I'd say that that experience, kind of fairly painful experience, many years ago could be the basis for what is for me a deeply seated belief in the idea of valuing and respecting difference. Um, but it ain't so. That wasn't what was formative for me. This was cultivated in me by my dad. Uh, as a kid, it was through osmosis, 
Because right, when you're nine years old, you aren't consciously thinking about um, that you've just learned a lesson about racial sensitivity uh, when your father calls out an older family member, let's say, for, for using a, a racial slur. Um, that's a very, very small example among many, many others that I perceived as a child um, from both of my parents, um, ultimately teaching me that discrimination in any form is wrong. When I was older, these lessons came through more direct observations. In the 90s and in the 2000s, um, my father actively, vocally, financially, politically, uh, supported um, statewide efforts to pass non-discrimination laws uh, to better protect gays here in Maine. He brought a passion and a commitment uh, and an urgency to this effort. I think this is not a word that's been used this evening, but if anybody knows my dad, urgency, <laughs> urgency. Everything is done with urgency. Uh, he corralled and cornered members of this state's political, business, and civic classes into joining him in that effort. And as a couple of you have mentioned, joining in that effort often meant cutting a check. Uh, so if anyone wonders how I came into my chosen profession of being a professional fundraiser, look no farther uh, than the old man. Um, on this particular point, and this is again just one example of having observed this, but something that drove me crazy during the first Maine Won't Discriminate referendum campaign here in the state in the mid-90s was when people would get this, oh, now I get it look on their face when they would, um, uh, when they would meet me and learn that George had a gay son. And you know, I'd like to be clear here, and as I have been before, um, before this gay son was even a glint in his eye, my father, a guy who you heard grew up on a dairy farm in small town Maine, knew that it was wrong to persecute people because of their sexual orientation. Um, because of that, uh, long before this gay son even knew himself he was gay, I knew that fundamental lesson that discrimination on that basis was wrong. It was harmful, and it was inhumane. Um, what my father is being honored for this evening is not having done a good job making sure his kids understood those fundamental lessons, uh, that fairness and inclusivity are good, and that the opposite of those things are not good. He's being honored because while he knew that, and he taught that to those closest to him, He's being honored because he got up, he got out, and he made change. Uh, and that change has telegraphed uh, or impacted people far beyond those who were closest to him. People who don't even know that they have benefited from getting up, getting out, and making change. Thank you very much for recognizing this and honoring him tonight. Thank you. George, on behalf of the board, the members of the center, and our volunteers, I want to present you with the 2019 Clatter Award for everything that you've done, and I think we've heard that tonight for the citizens of Maine. Thank you very 
much. You want to give this to me? <laughs> Wouldn't everybody here love to have a son like that? Governor Brennan, Vice General Counsel Caffrey, and other honored guests, and all of you gathered here tonight, thanks for your time this evening. I'm so grateful for it. I hope you all could take a moment to review uh, my many thank yous found in page four of the event program. There's so many people to thank would be here until nine, and uh, so I, I just had it written out. I would like to say a special thanks to John Oliver. My very heartfelt thanks to you, John. He put in dozens and dozens of hours. That four hours and 20 minutes, that took a lot longer. Uh, and he had to live through it before it went on the cutting room floor. <coughs> and also, can we uh, ask and say, happy birthday, John Oliver. Happy <laughs> birthday to To Sean and John Campbell, it ought to be obvious to everybody that I love you so very deeply, and you bless and honor my life. As you can see in the program, I've dedicated this award to Dave Redman and to Peter Feeney tonight. I am honored that Joan Redman, Arger, Joan, will you stand up? Dave's widow's here. And Dick Feeney, Commissioner Feeney, is here, Peter's father. You can read about these people in the dedication, and it could have taken that whole book and either one of them to talk about how great an influence they had in my life. Why do we gather here on a bitterly cold fall night? Like me, I'm sure you've already heard about George Campbell, enough about George Campbell to last a whole lifetime. <laughs> so now let's turn our attention to the real purpose of the Clatter Award event. First and foremost, service, like raising the sorely needed funds to support the mission and the programs of the Maine Irish Heritage Center. Also, to be grateful by taking the time considering what it truly means to honor culture. And finally, to reflect upon what is community and its value to all of us. Tonight is the chance for us to explore the intertwining of three strands of our lives, service, gratitude, and community. Two people here tonight have earned my lifelong gratitude. They gave me a platform to serve and weave myself into the fabric of Maine and the Portland communities. First of all, thank you, Governor Brennan, for including me on your team and the confidence you gave to my advice. He hadn't met me before my interview and surely didn't know that this future Portland City Councilor way back in 1979 couldn't point out Monjoy Hill on a map. Despite that glaring deficiency, he appointed me to two cabinet positions and trusted me with tasks that challenged me to meet his high standards of performance. However, I do remember disappointing him at least once. While serving as commissioner of DOT, the department was struggling to resolve a fiscal crisis that both of us had inherited. The governor had just returned from one of his trips to Ireland and called me to suggest that using sheep on the roadsides to keep vegetation down, as is the practice in Ireland, <laughs> could be both environmentally friendly and a cost saver. <laughs> By the way, uh, Dick Anderson, Dick Berenger, and others here know when you get an appointment from the governor, it doesn't have a date on it, it says, at the pleasure of. <laughs> so dutifully, I asked the chief engineer to research the practice and design a pilot program. 
<laughs> a few weeks later, he came back and he said, you'll have to tell the governor that his idea won't work with Maine sheep. <laughs> we have tried with all our might, but the sheep just can't operate our mowers safely. <laughs> Not a word of lie. <laughs> the other person is my trusted former colleague, Barbara Cottrell, who was Deputy Development Director when I first joined the administration. She mentored and guided me from day one in dealing with state house politics. To say I was clueless would be an understatement. In particular, I remember returning from my very first cabinet meeting. You know, it was that kind of meeting where everyone is asked to summarize their career and their accomplishments. To say that Governor Brennan had attracted an exceptionally talented team is no Irish blarney. I was nearly inconsolable on my return. I had compared myself to these people and not related to what they were about. And that's a bad move. Don't do it. As the late George Goble once said, I felt like a pair of brown shoes that are formal. <laughs> Barbara made it clear to me that the governor's judgment counted for something, and he saw in me that I was the right fit to help him create jobs and opportunities in Maine. Barbara didn't give me a pep talk, rather it was a directive. Essentially, she said, cowboy up and do your job. <laughs> Within a year, she was promoted to director while I moved over to transportation. Soon after, she and I were the state's, she and I were the state's lead negotiators under Governor Brennan's guidance for the BIW dry dock deal in Portland Harbor, a nationally recognized groundbreaking approach to creating meaningful public-private partnerships. I'm gonna go off script here, which is dangerous as we know on a national level and here too. <laughs> I would come back, I remember Barbara and I would come back and create all these great financial schemes and I'd sit down with the governor and he'd look at me and he could see lunch boxes and people <laughs> leaving the ironworks. That's how he thought, you know, he didn't think about the numbers and you know, oh this is a wonderful deal and this is innovative, it was about people feeding their families. That was the biggest lesson that I've ever had in my life in terms of putting a deal together. Many years after the project was operational, Buzz Fitzgerald, the late president of BIW, keynoted the Maine State Chamber of Commerce annual dinner where he unequivocally stated that that partnership had kept BIW here building the best ships for the Navy. That was 1982. How many families since then have benefited by the jobs preserved in Maine for the best shipbuilders in the world? These two people not only helped me, they are significantly responsible in the end for Maine and BIW's strong and enduring partnership. Please rise and join me in a standing ovation for Barbara and Governor Brennan. Moving on to community, who knew that just being here tonight is, is supposed to extend your life? Well, Scientific American knew and was happy to report the findings of a meta study of 300,000 participants across all ages, revealing that adults get a 50% boost in longevity if they have a strong social network. There are any a number of reasons why you're here tonight. I'm Irish, Mary told me to come, <laughs> George begged me to come. I wanna know what a clatter is. Why not, it's Friday night, 
in Portland, and the party starts downtown after this guy's done. <laughs> Whatever your reason, the common thread is you, my friends, are social, and you enjoy community and are predicted to live longer. And I might suggest more fulfilling lives at that. And that's what I think, that's what I want us to think about this evening, our communities, our social networks. What makes them function? What's at their core? In this era of cell phones, universal internet access, and social media, many have lost the joy and laughter of community. Texts and tweets with their barbs and criticisms are easy to hide behind, relentlessly driving people towards a tribal mentality, seeking solace and sanctuary among those who think and feel exactly the same way often robbing us of the joy and diversity of community, as well as good old civil debate. <laughs> Can living and thriving in true community really help us all? And if so, where do we find community and how do we feel it? For me, it's found in the smile of a child as they reach for cotton candy at a fair, as we socialize and share the bounty of Maine at the local farmer's market, in the Portland longshoremen who every day are reclaiming our place in the world of shipping. Thank you, Vinny, and your crowd. in the joyful tears and uproarious laughter at family weddings, in the din of sound and delightful aromas at our restaurants, brew pubs, and coffee houses, while enjoying the green trails of our parks and blue edges of our bays, in the camaraderie of guests at soup kitchens while sharing a hot meal, and as we kneel or bow together in the familiar ritual of our churches synagogues and mosques. How many ways do you celebrate, nurture, and grow in your community? Beyond our personal experiences, we sometimes find extraordinary communities in the glaring headlines of the press. For example, Farmington's recent tragic explosion killed the first responder, terribly burnt a half a dozen other heroes and left three dozen homeless. Did the community turn away? No, they were Farmington strong, leaning in with energy, love, and determination to rewrite the story of their community. Did you know that until the Farmington Fire Department could stand duty again, the first responders from all over Maine organized a volunteer effort to fill in for weeks on end, a truly amazing level of service and sacrifice. I ran out of speech. No. <laughs> you should be so lucky. Where's Kay Rand? Did she make it here? She was going to be late. She always helped reorganize things for me. <laughs> we also came together in crisis this summer when our city leaders and people throughout Maine provided housing, food, and opportunity for an influx of asylum seekers arriving here clutching bus tickets from Texas after they courageously trekked across the world to find a safe community. America watched in awe as our open arms <laughs> and America watched in awe as our open arms welcomed strangers to our towns and cities. That's our main community, a gold standard by any measure. Our Irish ancestors didn't get that same welcome. More likely they saw a sign, Irish need not apply. Nor did Greek, Italian, Franco, and Jewish ancestors fare a heck of a lot better. But in a place called Maine, our ancestors have created a welcoming village. Not a perfect community, but one that does invite you to join. Let's never lose our shared humanity coming together in times of celebration 
as well in times of great need. In closing, I believe and hope you do as well that community is not where we see through each other, but where we see each other through. I leave you all with an Irish blessing. May the roof above us never fall in and the friends gathered below it never fall out. Thank you for the honor of being with you tonight. My, my gift, my gift, my gift to all of you is I'm not singing. Joe is. <laughs> Now, the song has been picked by George. He's not going to sing it, except for along with all of us. And uh, Joe Markley is going to lead us in the, uh, his version of, when, as I understand it, when Irish eyes are smiling. Thank you, Wood. All right, everybody, let's make this sound like St. Patrick's Day here tonight. <laughs> when Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's like a morning spring. And the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, you know the words, sure the world is bright and gay. And when Irish eyes are smiling, sure they'll steal your heart away. There's a tear in your eye. And I'm wondering why, for it never should be there at all. With such power in your smile, sure a stone you'd beguile, so there's never a teardrop should fall. And the sound of your laughter is like some fairy song, and your eyes twinkle bright as can be. You should laugh all the while, and all other times smile. So come smile, a smile for me, everybody. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's like a morning spring. And the little of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all the world seems bright and gay. And when Irish eyes are smiling, should they steal your heart away? One more time. When Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's like a morning spring. And the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angel. Sing. When Irish hearts are happy, all oh, the world seems bright and gay. And when Irish eyes are smiling, sure they'll steal your heart away. I just wanted to mention one thing before uh, uh, wishing you safe home, as I would say in Ireland, and that is that um, this has been financially, uh, this has been the most successful Cloud Award ever. George said at the beginning, I think we ought to set a goal. And so, uh, and so, so the, the goal was set and it was pursued, and it has been. So thank you to everybody here, to a lot of people who aren't here, for your support.